Not bad. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate uh, your willingness to chat right now. I feel like I'm having a little emergency that I'm hoping you can help <laughs> with. Yeah, it's, um, you know, this kind of stuff has come up before and it's always interesting because if, like, I like to get people on the same page, you know, and so many people are just not on the same page. And <clears throat> a lot of this stuff is known, right? And so it's frustrating that the different parts of the discourse lag because people don't know what's going on. And, yeah. 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 Well, so um, let me frame it this way for you. I was aware just from having heard, um, you know, Han Hansi Freenach speak. Uh, actually, the first time I heard him was uh, when he when uh, Jim Rutt interviewed him a um, couple oh, okay. months ago. Okay. And uh, and then I got into the uh, Facebook page, the Hansi Facebook group, and. Um, started chatting with some folks there and uh and then there's an integral politics facebook group and someone was like uh trying to get me into alexander dugan two months month month and a half ago and i was like okay i'll check i've heard of this guy and i went a little bit deeper and found this whole postmodern traditionalism thing and how they kind of are into the meta modern aesthetic and um and then just last night, uh, the next episode in this saga for me is um, someone on the, the Hansi Facebook page messaged me. Um, I forget, it doesn't matter who it is, but they sent me a couple of uh, links to this guy, Keith Woods on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, wow, he's got lots of subscribers. He's only been doing videos for like less than a year, it looks like. And uh, I watched the first video I watched was on... Um, science and liberalism and it was this like really insightful critique of you know the way that a materialistic form of science and this liberal even neoliberal world order are kind of based on this um false debased understanding of what the human being is and and what we should be doing here and i was like oh yeah this is great this guy's smart and uh and i you know i checked him out on twitter and realized that he's uh, uh a, f a nationalist i guess is just we'll start with that more neutral term and see Eth where we go uh, yeah ethno-nationalist ethno-nationalist yeah. sure. so i don't know this just keeps happening to me like because the same thing with dugan like his his um familiarity with the the postmodern um mentality and his ability to turn it against itself to me is there's something there's something terrifying about it because I find myself agreeing with the critiques of neoliberalism and the sort of postmodern culture industry. And then they pivot to the solution. And I'm like, that's not the final solution I was hoping for. Yeah. And so I'm, there's, I'm, there's I'm like, a guy. How do, how do we respond? That's my. Yeah. I, uh, I saw one of your videos where you talked about Dugan a bit. <clears throat> And um, I forget the guy's name, but there's like a, a Canadian scholar who's like a translator, you know, of Dugan's works. And so, you know, he's sort of become like a proponent. And I forget his name, right. but he was actually on the STOA. Like the STOA invited him to, to do a talk for whatever reason. And there's also a clip of that guy on like CBC or something yep, talking yep. about it. Yeah, yeah I've seen that. So, my takeaway was like, okay, I'm getting that this guy is saying, you know, Dugan is making some interesting critiques or whatever, but like, this is the pattern that like, whatever some odd conservative or fascist or whatever might say that might be true of critique of liberalism, like somebody on the left has done it or hundreds of people on the left have done it. Mm -hmm. So for whatever reason, like those narratives don't get a true the traction right like i mean take like a marxist scholar like david harvey or something like people just don't know because they don't have a big pro public profile like he's not he's not a uh, whispering in putin's ear you know whereas well, dugan is and so yeah. and it attracts this large base of of people who like they're not doing research they're looking for a narrative that hooks them in and so I think that's what, what Dugan's doing. Like it's, 
the, the bait and switch is, okay, a critique of liberalism as mm -hmm. if it's original, and then you know, fascism is the answer, like, or, or uh, Putin's authoritarianism, right? And it's, yeah, it's just, it's unnecessary because there's always some, somewhere on the left, better critiques are being made. That, that's my takeaway from yeah. that yeah. guy. Yeah, I mean, none of the critiques I'm hearing of neoliberalism are new to me. I've, I've learned about this, yeah. this take from the left <laughs> and what I've immersed myself in, but I see these guys doing it. And it's the, I think the issue here with like, why isn't David Harvey's you know, perspective more popular? It's an aesthetic thing, right? It's like, it's the aesthetics of it that makes it more rhetorically persuasive. And it, there's a way that, you know, um, this guy, Keith Woods, he's like speaking to uh, young white men who are not feeling like this world really has a place for them anymore in the way that maybe they thought it would or think it is supposed to. And um, they don't like capitalism because of the way that it's sucking the meaning out of all of our lives. And it's like, okay, there's a condition being created by neoliberal capitalism that the left is very well aware of. And, but now this new tighter, uh, higher spiral of the political dialectic on the right is, is also sharing that critique of capitalism and saying, um, back to the land and blood and soil and, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, you know, Dugan's way of laying out the terrain here is helpful, actually, fascism, communism, and, and liberalism. And uh, I don't, I, I guess my dilemma here is, you know, I don't know that uh, if those are the three sort of um, right. domains that like I'm on the communism team because I mean, I'm certainly not on the fascism team, but there are elements of like local bioregionalism and localism and even like these sort of romantic esoteric forms of, of spirituality that I I'm kind of into. Um, but, but the politics of it is the fascism. Obviously I'm not so into as a Jew, but liberalism also similarly it's like i think pluralism i don't like to call it multiculturalism i want a deeper pluralism really but there's something about that gesturing towards democracy and a respect for individuals i think we need to do yeah. more to respect communities also but so i'm not like i'm not willing to just go all in with communism in this three-way battle because i think historically like the, the communists lost to the nazis uh so at least, I mean, maybe in Russia, some form of communism beat Hitler ultimately, but um, like, where do we go if these are the three options? Like, how do we navigate yeah. this situation? Yeah, uh, Michael Millerman was that guy's name. Uh. And, uh, you know, so he's a political science PhD. And what struck me listening to him is like, it's like, okay, well, he did a bunch of deep research on Dugan, but like, it's, it's like he didn't do any other readings. <laughs> that's, that's just what struck me is like, he was uh -huh. so enthralled, like, oh, Dugan's so original. It's like, well, have you read anything else? Like you just wasted your PhD just translating this guy. And yeah, I mean, th this is what it comes down to for me is like, there's so many thinkers out there and there's so much, like when you do research, you just, when you approach it honestly it's bottomless you're overwhelmed with sources you, you never yeah. really come to a conclusion on anything but yeah it, it's a dead end is what i'm saying because if, if alexander dugan is an advisor to putin well that that's a non-starter <laughs> you know that's a red flag yeah um politically speaking you know we need to just be more honest about where our philosophy comes from and what the implications are um yeah i mean and, and dugan just openly says like you know russia should annex the ukraine and 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 yeah. as much of eastern europe as it as it can get <laughs> you know so it's it's a political position that um is uh Im imperial imperialistic and uh as an american I, it's hard for me to sit here and say imperialism's bad <laughs> yeah but um but it is <laughs> so yeah and and uh, yeah, American imperialism has continued despite the left's attempts to, you know, to to put it in check, to to d draw it down, to end it. You know, I think, yeah, the the hard left now 
um, like to distinguish ourselves from you know liberals is very anti-war, very anti-imperialist, anti-colonial. Right. Like the liberals are perfectly willing to um, um, ally with neoconservatives to defeat Trump, the outsider. Um, and so like the foreign, it's like neoliberal domestic policy and neoconservative foreign policy are like hand in glove. Uh, yeah. And we're seeing that obviously now in, in the new Biden uh, coalition yeah, totally. of, war, of war criminals. Totally. Yeah. So uh, I can clarify the Keith Woods thing because as oh, soon please. as that came out, he, you know, he did a video on metamodernism and we were all like, what is this? And, <laughs> and, and I, I, I talked to him. I can't remember if I actually talked to him or we just had a conversation on Twitter. I think I may have actually talked to him, but we cleared up some things. Like I figured out like, yeah, he's just a young Irish guy or whatever. And he's obviously smart, but like still finding himself but he identified as like ethno social uh, ethno nationalist um you know which i i just say like right out the gates like things like this are unnecessary like you don't have to subscribe to such an uh, untenable position on the face of it right but that it, it it all depends on what your assumptions about race are you know like if you believe in race as a thing not just as a construct then you're going to be more prone to those types of arguments. Um, and then the other thing that struck me is I thought he was like, you know, far right wing, but he kind of identified as like eco-fascist. Uh, uh, like, mm -hmm. so, so he kind of identified, he identified as far left. And I was like, kind of like, huh. <laughs> like, he identified as far left. Interesting. Well, I, I, have so, heard I, him, so. I've, I have heard him critique the, uh, the way that um, corporate, neoliberal capitalism has subsumed at least the the, uh, the anti-racist politics of the left and many uh, without the understanding of Marxist you know material based critiques of political economy are thinking that well that's what the left means is just to make sure that all the athletes have BLM on their jerseys and um, you know that we work on our white privilege and then everything will be fine and he's, he's saying, oh, like an actual Marxist critique of capitalism is worthwhile, but he puts it in a nationalist instead of an internationalist. Yeah, it's name. kind of like so far left that it's like reverse fishhook theory. Like it doesn't even <laughs> make sense anymore. Like uh -huh. I consider myself like as, as far left as you can go and it still makes sense and you advocate for main, mainstream positions like, like healthcare. And but it seems to me though, because there's, this is, this is postmodern traditionalism, right? So it's not just the traditional view of like racial essentialism. I think it's actually admitting that there's a constructed dimension to race, which is why immigration is so threatening because whiteness can be polluted. <laughs> it's not just a substance that's like eternal and fixed. It's like, no, it's, it's, a, living, it's a living project that we have to maintain, you know? Um, yeah. The uh, the other thing is he he like nobody would have known this unless I talked to him and so I got the backstory and you know I shared it on the MetaModern forum back when it was an email list still but he got all of his info about metamodernism from a conversation with uh, Kashik Vikas you know this Facebook character has multiple accounts he's a right wing guy basically and kind of oh he's the one that sent me the links okay yeah. okay yeah so so that's where keith got his take on metamodernism in the first place and i'd approach uh -huh. keith saying like where are you getting your info like i'm always haranguing people that are just like kind of making shit up even Cite if they're sources yeah exactly it's it's there's conservatives on the list too who just make stuff up or or twist the the language to fit their conservative needs but like if you do all the readings if you read Ver, vermulen and vandenacker and you read hansi you read me and other like all the, like i compile the list of you know all the sources of metamodernism right and most of them like talk past each other they're not like necessarily a paradigm but there's different little insights that come from the use of the word, right? So I track the use of the word itself, and then you can kind of distill some meaning.
but even even in the core formulations by like Vermeulen and Van Nacker, you know, they're scholars. So they acknowledge the validity of things like Marxism, you know, that's included in the analysis. And, and then, you know, they talk about how there's like left wing and right wing, like incarnations of the phenomenon, like Bernie Sanders versus Donald Trump, right? They put this all under the kind of metamodern umbrella. But I, I can tacitly accept that just for the purposes of that discourse. But I, but I reject it. On, I reject that there can be a left wing and a right wing metamodernism as a, as a, as a system, as a discourse. I think, I think it's inherently left wing in its roots because that's part of the academic tradition, but then it, it necessarily goes into a kind of post left where it's, it's concerned with issues that are post sort of post political, like climate change. And, um, we wish it was post-political, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, and also like I've done a lot of research on hypermodernism, and um, there's there's a large discourse there that is also kind of remains unsynthesized. Not a lot of people talk about it, and so I've got a draft going on that. But it's like hmm. it, you, when you when you compile all the sources together, there's actually enough to kind of juxtapose metamodernism and hypermodernism, and this is what. Albert Borgman did anyways, writing in 1989. So the use of the terms go back to then even, and you have quite a cogent analysis about these two, you know, the bifur a bifurcation uh, of basically postmodernism into metamodernism and hypermodernism. So most people miss all this, right? But it's, it's mm -hmm. in the literature, it's in the, it's in the scholarship. Yeah, but you're asking a lot there for yeah. people to, to read. Um, you know, we're in a media environment where, uh, you know, I'm just astounded that this 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 kid Keith Woods has uh, like 25,000 subscribers or something, and like they all watch. Know? Yeah, yeah, I haven't checked his channel in like over <clears throat> over a year. Um, it was over a year when I talked to him. Wow. Yeah. And yeah, so I'm, I'm, um, I'm really feeling a sense of um, urgency around, like, I don't really care. I'm not as invested as maybe you are around like metamodernism and how that term gets cashed out. Like um, I've enjoyed everything I've, I've, I've read in it and, and listened to the folks who are involved. I, I think that it's, it's, uh, it's exciting. I'm more concerned with um, the <laughs> uh, geopolitical implications mm -hmm. of, um, these movements because he really wants to be part of a movement to awaken uh, I, white identity in people as not white people as not just a source of guilt but as a source of pride and power and conscious protective like as a political agenda and that I think can that can it's already catching fire, but it's like we're on the verge of it becoming um, really uh, just spiraling out of hand. Um, yeah. And especially if Donald Trump wins again, which looking at the polling data before and after in Wisconsin uh, with, with the recent uh, unrest there, Trump's going to be doing very well as a result of this unrest. It's helping his uh, case, you know? Yeah, and I'm I'm concerned too. Like, I'm less and less attached to kind of policing the 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 meaning of the term because just no, nobody cares, nobody <laughs> listens. Uh, it's uh, it's like you, be, beating a dead horse. Well, you but, could do it ironically. That might yeah, I kind of I kind of do. Um, yeah. like I kind of my my article in the side view was kind of kind of a definitive kind of overview, and you know, beyond that, people are going to do whatever they're, they're going to do with it. But um, so, so, you, so you have, we have a problem with, with far right people and conservative people in general with their approach to this race topic. And also this, you know, this Keith Woods guy. And if he's, if he wants to identify as far left or whatever, like it doesn't matter. He's off, he's off the spectrum. That may have been a year ago. I, just based on this interview of him, I mm -hmm. watched two, uh, from two weeks ago, I wouldn't, 
imagine he would call himself far left. Uh, mm -hmm. He was critiquing liberalism and conservatism as both part of the liberal, you know, matrix of, of positions yeah. and saying we need a third position, which is ethno-nationalism. Oh, it's brutal. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's tough to argue against because I, my personally, the way I react is just thinking, well, it's just so dumb. So you just, you just so, this is all so stupid. And that's not a persuasive argument, <laughs> but, but that's my reaction. No, my, my initial reaction is like, no, don't do that. Like, stop it. <laughs> But yeah. but I but it's I I I I detect the um, the allure the aesthetic allure of it. Um, I think I mean, that the problem extends very much into the mainstream because the whole intellectual dark web thing, regardless of what it wants to admit, was a white reaction to social justice, culture, and race discourse. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean that it's like, like you know, to bring Jim Rutt into this, right? Because I'm supposed to to talk to him uh, soon, <clears throat> and it's like, you know, they 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 just get oversensitive about critical theory. And James Lindsay, for example, who's on Jim Rutt's podcast recently, like the whole mo there is just to um, you know sort of defend their own whiteness when really it's not even under attack like the critical theories criticize a kind of abstraction of whiteness right that that goes beyond skin color so like anyone who thinks about this stuff socially can disentangle um yeah I, I think you need a, to have i think social you, construct. Just, just to say though if you don't have a graduate degree in a humanities subject i don't think you get that they're not talking about you as a white Person, right you know <laughs> right but some of yeah i mean he's he his background's in math but he you know right. says he's uh you know self-taught with all this stuff and then you have i worry a lot because through the idw stuff and still still through people like uh the game b people and alexander bard and people like that like um they have different backgrounds it might be in like psychology or or what or tech or whatever but yeah they bard was a porn star wasn't he <laughs> i don't guy. know about that but he's a pop he was a pop star <laughs> oh like pop, a, okay a music a right, music right. guy um you know um um oh, what's his name greg greg enriquez who did a recording with mm -hmm. um john john Verbeke recently you know he's got yeah. issues with this stuff too like and i've called him out on it you know he 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 gets defensive like because he as a white man in academia uh in his perception has been critiqued too much you know it's it's too hot for him and he, you know so he gets defensive but i as a white man have never experienced that uh, maybe because i've been an advocate of social justice not somebody who's trying to work around it you know um, but what I tried to tell Keith back in the day and, you know, what I wish he would put some effort into understanding is that like, uh, you know, um, yeah, I mean, I'm sorry, but you know, your, your skin color, uh, doesn't, doesn't entitle you to any kind of, um, You know prejudicial uh political systems <laughs> like mm -hmm. it, it's just it's just dumb for people to consciously marry their own identity with um with that trapping you know that oh like oh oh i'm white so i'm like i'm part of a thing called white people but you get the problem here right that i i i don't get defensive when i read critical race theory because I get the level of abstraction that's being worked with. But yeah. most people, especially now that critical theory has passed into the mainstream and corporations are now running ads like imbued with this stuff, most people are not getting the abstraction and they, white people feel personally attacked by it and conservatives cement that by saying, you know, they're trying to take away your heritage 
which is, you know, it's not what's being said at the level of the academic argument, but that people don't, that's a level of abstraction above where 90%, 95% of Americans are at. Yeah. So why we're missing the, we're not communicating effectively is, is what I, I feel like the problem is here. Yeah, it's like, it's complicated, but it's not that complicated. Like I, you know, whether through a lens of like mass society or sociology of knowledge or whatever, like, uh, or comedy, I love to say that people are stupid and to make fun of that. Um, <clears throat> but at the same time, like, I have faith in the, uh, in the capacity of the ordinary person to understand this stuff if they just make an effort. Oh, for sure. Or if they I just mean, lessen. Like, no, like, this is the thing with being a leftist is, like, nobody even listens to you, you know, for the past four or five years. Like, this dominant discourse of, like, reactionary liberalism and conservatism is just, you know, totally dominated the conversation. Yeah. Um, yeah. Nobody wants to learn anything. They don't want to get into that mindset. Yeah. But while be- they're trying to, like consume and consolidate all this bogus information out there right but to to uh just a little self-critique here of academics like it's just as easy to be an idiot in academia in the in the literal sense of being so like narrowly specialized in some field that you know because you got a phd in that narrow field you think you're an expert in everything and you mouth off and i'll have opinions and and you can be an idiot and very well trained as an academic just as you can be a coal miner and be an idiot or be a really actually smart well well uh you know um uh, not necessarily well traveled if you're like a west virginia coal miner but you know you can be uh reasonable just you know and not narrowly stuck in a particular special focus so, you know, idiocy, I'm just saying it's, we, we have to um, be democratic about our yeah. distribution of it. Yeah, no, that's exactly what I'm saying, though, too, is just like, if we could just have a, an actual honest conversation, like we could break through a lot of the noise and like work, you know, we need workshops and focus groups to, um, yeah, actually help people grok this and like whatever it takes. Like, I mean, I, I just think there's enough written on race. Like, it's not that we need more books. We, mm-hmm. we need better, um, like open education, like heuristics and stuff. And, and, and of course, like, so the, you know, game B people can't lead this conversation, right? They're already reactive uh to this kind of stuff but i don't know i mean the simplicity i'm trying to unpack on the other side of this the culture war over it it's like it's it's the the metaphor i think of is it's like breaking the sound barrier right as you approach the sound barrier it's like a lot of noise and turbulence and then when you finally get it it's like silence and clarity <laughs> yeah you know and what that I'm, sounds nice. Yeah. <laughs> I guess we, you know, we like, I mean, it, it sucks, but we have to reach out to people like Keith Woods, like, like I did. And I tried to, to incentivize him to, you know, view things sociologically to come over to my discourse. Like, yeah, but, but, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't succeed at that, but well, it's I feel a practice like yeah. to reach out too. I, 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 and I, you know, I hope maybe this put his name in the title of this video. We'll see what happens. <laughs> but you know, because um, there's a way in which um, political rhetoric can become unnecessarily polarized just by virtue of the fact that we're not talking to each other. Um, and so, I guess a question I would, you know, want to if, see if you're interested in exploring is. Um, this issue of if, if we do want a more internationalist um, orientation uh, that doesn't fall prey to the liberal or neoliberal form of globalism, um, what, what are the sources of 
universalistic or quasi-universalistic meaning that, that allow us as a human community to share a sense of purpose and destiny. Um, and it's, I think, still, despite some progress we've made in this area, it seems very utopian to talk about this. You know, it's just, it's easy. It's a cliche to talk about like, we're all human, can't we just get along? And it's sad that it's become a cliche that no one can, it's like no one really, we can only say it ironically now, right? But can we, can we, can we be sincere uh, about it? Or, you know, sincere in our irony about it, but can, what, what sources of collective meaning are there that can, that can ground a international socialist uh, a sense of common humanity. Where do we start with that? Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean. That's the question we have to answer, I think, <laughs> to respond to the postmodern traditionalists, I, I think. Yeah. Um, the obvious structural answer that comes to mind to me is like, like there's a correlation between the increase of um, you know, right-wing populism and authoritarianism and anti-intellectualism and economic inequality, <laughs> right? But even when you solve for economic inequality, these, these dark forces keep going, right? So Lula was the president of Brazil for a period of time and lifted people out of poverty, right? And so the, the conservatives that came into power and imprisoned him and all this, like, they want to reverse that trend. They want to privatize and they want to increase inequality. And so there's a relationship between, you know, the, the healthiness of our discourse and the inequality. And we're at a time of extreme inequality. Um, so that's, I mean, this is like the main, like, like the, 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 the thrust of kind of leftist, um, policy is to reduce reduce that inequality and address climate change and stuff like that and how do we address inequality when um in i mean i know the american context best in the history of this country um economic opportunity has very much been um, um structured to serve certain races and and to not serve others or to literally turn others into servant, uh, slaves. Um, and so in order to address economic inequality in the United States, you, you can't avoid addressing it in terms of reparations for um, racist injustice. And that creates a reaction, right? Because the poor working class white people are like, you know, what about us? And so, you know, this is maybe the difference between like Bernie's more universalistic approach and then like a, a Warren type means tested or, or racial, you know, way of distrib redistributing wealth. And I, I feel like clearly the, in the abstract reparations for slavery are the only just, you know, course of action to take in, yeah. in, in concrete terms though. It actually it can get messy and how you some cases are clear but other cases it's like well how do we actually decide who gets what and so you know are you more on the universalistic side of you know medicare for all college for all affordable housing for all rather than focusing on the racial reparations approach to it or i'm for both i'm, I'm yeah. i would definitely answer that i'm for both i think like my approach to paradigm shift, if we just call it that, and not metamodernism, is that what needs to be done is like virtually the most impossible thing, you know, like the most unthinkable. So like I, you know, like truth and reconciliation commissions, like full on for, for indigenous genocide and for slavery, and, you know, uh, dismantle the military industrial complex, and like, this is why I want to build consensus around things that I think are obvious, you know, and I say often, like the work has already been done, like the scholarship is out there. 
it's just we have to we have to sift it out of the the noise that's created that maintains the status quo like if you work in a consultancy or in advertising or in lobbying or in defense like you're just part of the system man you're not doing anything to to uh get out of those paradoxes but in my you know like lofty aspirations this is what has to be done if we want a planetary utopia relative utopian society and going back to the narrative question you were posing like there's already so much out there about you know cosmopolitanism and you know so much in pop culture and uh, like things like the olympics it's just part of every country's tradition and it's a a, a global you know kind of uh, ritual and there's tourism like so it, it's it's so ironic that so many people get sucked in and wrapped up in the in these reactionary narratives right because there's so much well, good that's there, tied with the economic inequality and the, the, well, right. the war on terror right it's all you know but like the Olympics are sponsored by Pepsi and, you know, <laughs> it's, and, and tourism is for rich people or middle class, yeah, upper yeah. middle class people. And it's like, so these are exclusive, these are um, uh, easily critiqued for sure. attempts at global culture. Right. That, they're, that don't they're, end up really being culture. They're not culture. Yeah, they're, they're, they're part of the co corporate woke yeah. um, problem these, these days more than ever. Yeah. <clears throat> So yeah, I mean, this is why I advocate for radical structural solutions, like like especially what the Bernie platform offered within the U.S. Um, yeah, revitalization of the UN is another pipe dream of mine, and and uh, and other people probably. Um, yeah, is yeah the 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 isolationist reactionary populist turns of all these various countries. And, and yeah, it's, it's the decline of both liberalism and conservatism. And so uh, the, the third poll that's emerging, if, if we're, you know, I think there, there can be some common ground between different groups that perceive three kind of schools or, or wings of politics. Um, Cause that's how I see it. I see it as a, 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 a a decadent um, defunct tradition of liberalism in the center of politics. And that might actually, you know, if Biden wins, that may serve some functional role in transition, right? But then there's the right wing. Um, so liberalism, conservatism, and this would be like the kind of classic both sides juxt juxtaposition of Democrats and the Republicans, right? And so, you know, Chomsky would criticize uh, the, the two-party system, right? And then, so we, there's, there's an independent slash socialist alternative outside of those two or around those two. But a lot of independents a stat I saw recently go towards Trump. So there needs to be like, a transition maybe through the Democratic Party to a new political plurality in the US in which uh, a socialist alternative is actually mainstream. And so I, I would like to see a kind of merging of all the third party alternatives because there's too many out there. There's the, like the Green Party is very small, mm -hmm. but it's the first thing people usually think of when they think of a third party and then there were like there was a well, workers party i don't know yeah the libertarian party did way better than the green party oh yeah in 2016 yeah gary johnson had like eight or eight eight percent right that's right that's right yeah gary yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and jill stein was like one two percent maybe yeah one percent so yeah the libertarians are doing better than the the greens right now um yeah so Hmm. Yeah, I almost feel like uh, the 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 liberals and the conservatives of the pre-Trump uh, political arrangement are actually now all on Biden's team, and Trump is um, an, an anomaly. Um, yes, it's nominal. It is nominally Republican, but uh, you know the Republicans are like 
we don't really have a platform. We're just going with, with this populist right wing carnival barker because um, we've committed at this point. Um, yeah. So the, 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 the Democratic Party, to my mind, is like, it's just, we're, you know, I'm doing my best not to say bad things about Biden. I want Biden to win. But I'm also worried that um, the Democratic Party, if they win, is going to become this new centrist, <laughs> liberal, conservative monolith that, like, yeah. is going to be difficult to, to beat uh, in an election. I mean, yeah, except, yeah, except yeah. that there might be a smarter, more strategic, um, you know, less egomaniacal Trump 2.0 who challenges the Democrat in two, in four years, who uh, you might, might take power back. Um, but that we're, we're, but those, they would, that Trump 2.0 would take power back by getting independents on board who don't want the democratic, cons, you know, the neoliberal neoconservative consensus behind Biden to, to govern. And so I feel like the left is, we need to, we need to win the independence and, and we, we need to win older black people. Bernie got the, the Latino community, and not in Florida. He brought up Fidel Castro. I don't know why he did that. <laughs> but um, the, the older black people did not want to vote for Bernie. Yeah, um, I think the so media, the I think the media brought up, I don't remember exactly the, but there was, the media brought up Castro. Right, and they and this was like a ploy. They were pushing it on Bernie. And they forced him to answer and these Bernie questions. Bernie said a shit. Bernie said it just said that's not relevant. Stop yeah, playing red baiting. Exactly. They 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 baited him a lot. In different and he should have said, "I agree with Obama." That's what he should have said. He did and say left, that. He did. Well, he should have just left yeah. it at that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So and yeah, now they're calling call Biden a socialist. So nothing. Matters. I know. I know. I know. But um. No, I was I was saying in text to to somebody earlier today, like I'm increasingly of the position, you know, that we just have to own the label socialism because yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I have for a while, but it's still depending on who you're talking to, it's uh, it's not co it's not coherent enough to have a conversation for for them, and so from a zeitgeist point of view, you know, I think this is the, the broad cultural mission is just to, you know, influence the language positively. And like, I always say to people who want to argue against socialism and, you know, bring up, bring up the most absurd arguments and false premises, like Einstein was a socialist. Okay. Albert Einstein. And like, he, he made a good argument for it, right? This isn't just a label he took on frivolously, right? We can consult Einstein's advocacy for socialism. And so it, it always comes back to me that the, just the fact that there's no, there's no real debate. There's no real good faith inquiry. If, if we're not getting past these like basic, basic tenets of yeah. theory and and socialist practice, like there's, there's no, there's no honesty yeah. in, the, in that. So. Well, and you know, I, I like to say I am in favor of uh, libertarian socialism, which, you know, maybe that's anarchism by another name, but uh, you know, I, I, I really, um, there's critiques I have of Murray Bookchin, but I appreciate um, his work on social ecology and what, what he called libertarian socialism. Um, and I think, when people hear that, they're like, it, they can't knee jerk react to it if they're more conservative because it's, it's, it, cause it at first sounds like a, an oxymoron. But the point here is that most people on the right uh, or center right, when they hear socialism, they think, oh, you want the government to own everything and run everything. It's like, no, no, no. I want workers <laughs> to own the, the, the companies that they work for and, and to manage and self-govern the companies that they work for. I don't want the state, you know? So yeah. it's, it's a shift that says, no, I'm actually wanting to empower individuals to uh, benefit from their own labor power and to be incentivized to, um, form, to form corporate firms. And I think we need to change corporate charter law so that it's more on a 
benefit corporation model rather than just profit. But if workers are benefiting when their company does well, instead of just the CEO and the shareholders, they're going to do a better job. You know, they're going to be more yeah. connected to the work that they're doing and not as alienated. And so I, I think we, it's, it's, a, it's not just a rhetorical trick. It's, it's actually substantive in that I don't want a giant government bureaucracy making all these decisions in a centralized command and control economy because that doesn't work, actually. You know, but what we want to do is have you know, community-owned uh, you know, power production, electricity production. And we want to have you know, Medicare for all, I'm totally all on board for, but I also think like, there's a way that the, uh, like Finland does this where they, they to avoid the, the concern of a centralized government funding agency that ends up having to make a lot of decisions about who gets what care and where the tax comes from. Like you can create a tax pool more locally for, for socialized medicine um, and it's locally administered. And so it, it gets rid of that fear of one giant agency and you're just a number and a computer and you know, so there are ways that I, it's not like I'm making concessions that says, oh, I get socialism can be bad and we can fix it in these ways. It's more just, this is what um, I think the, the tradition has always been saying um, more broadly than just Marxism, including anarchism. Like we yeah. want to empower individuals too. We're not yeah. just about, you know, state ownership of everything. Yeah. And there's some conservatives that, whether ironically or insincerely, they use the term national socialism, like Nazis. Yeah. Yeah. But, but um, so they're not like, it, yeah, it strikes me that they don't even know what they're for because, because contemporary socialism is not, I mean, you wouldn't pair those words national socialism. Like every nation, every state rather, nation state, is going to have its own kind of administration of these transitions. But, you know, in keeping with the broader tradition and, and Michael Brooks's term, like cosmopolitan socialism, like that, that's what it has to be. And so all the language you're using too, about like worker cooperatives and stuff, that's definitely the, the kind of uh, the main terms people use, but like, I try to think outside that too and, and decouple um, work from income. You know, I want UBI and decouple like ownership from work even, right? Because there's too many different corporations out there and we need better job mobility, right? So if, because there's already high turnover in different career fields, um, but it's difficult to get a job sometimes. So like you need to be able to yeah. have healthcare and have income and then uh, choose where you participate in what is remaining of the capitalist yeah. system, right? I, mean, I think- This I is think, the dream. Yeah, I don't, see, I, I wanna decouple capitalism from markets. Not all markets have to be capitalist, right? Capitalist markets are markets where corporations legally required to make a profit for shareholders and then the whole financialization process on top of that that's capitalism yeah, um yeah. markets markets don't have to operate you can still you can have worker owned co-ops engaging in a market competing for for the share of the, of people who want their products right so it's for me it's like yes basic income which for me means like food shelter education and healthcare are just like you, everyone gets a ticket <laughs> to those yeah. things, right? And so there's that's the bottom floor. And but on top of that, yeah, people are want to take initiative and, and be entrepreneurs and, and create cool things. And as long as we have some some you know restrictions in place around the ecological impact of whatever they want to do and the social impact, go for it. Like make your make your great new invention and and people and make people have fun with it or whatever but like the the social there needs to be a, a bottom floor and we can't just keep stuffing people into the basement and having tent cities you know and it's like yeah um so i i really do want to make sure that people aren't continuing to conflate markets and capitalism <laughs> like i want markets too 
Yeah. Um, I think markets afford a certain degree of creative dynamic um, um, change that I like. Yeah. And you know? it's better when it's all out in the open, right? Cause black markets are obviously a bad thing Yeah, and they're created by prohibition laws. And so, you know, the, the way, you know, homelessness in tent cities emerge too is like capitalism hides its abstraction its extraction and abstraction of wealth so then people are like whoa like how did all these homeless people get here like it's just <laughs> in the grand scheme of things it's just like poof, must be lazy happens, right? yeah. yeah but like it's it's so much more ubiquitous and invisible that it, it's happening because by fetishizing capitalism, the wealth literally just keeps getting, uh, you know, evaporated upwards, well, upwards, upwards, upwards. And so yeah. social programs get cut, taxes on the wealthy get cut. And then people are like, well, how did this happen? <laughs> it's like, they're, you know, yeah. Well, it's the process of commodification where a, a house, which has a use value, like living in it, you know, provides, it provides shelter for people. Um, that use value becomes purely exchange value. It's commodified. And then you end up with a situation where um, San Francisco has thousands of empty mansions that are purely investments for people that don't even live in the United States sometimes, usually. And meanwhile, right down the block, thousands of people are homeless. You know, and so it's like we have this society of tremendous wealth and material means to produce these beautiful homes and these condominiums, and they're empty because the only purpose they serve is as an investment for someone, you know, to, to increase their portfolio. And so, yeah, capitalism creates this situation where we mistake abstract wealth or money for value, like real value, which is like having a house to live in, you know. And um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's gotten to a point yeah. now where, um, fuck, I mean, I live out in a more rural area now, but I used to live in the San Francisco Bay Area in Berkeley. And, um, you know, San Francisco is always for the, you know, I've been here, I, I lived there for a decade and it was bad all the way back through the whole Obama era. But it is, it's like, um, you know, when you exit the highway, near uh, like Berkeley or something now it's it looks like like a ghettofied burn a version of Burning Man you know um it's just it's not it's not like suburban sprawl it's like tent sprawl and the city's just like well we're gonna set up some porta potties and yeah. just this is how this is the new normal yeah and the real travesty is that like you know, bringing it back to politics and discourse is that these things aren't impossible to fix. They're not a mystery to a lot of people who know how to fix it. And a lot mm -hmm. of those people are leftist or will vote leftist. And so twice in a row, by the, by the powers that be, centrist and right, um, you know, suppressed the Bernie movement. And so this is, it's so counterintuitive and it's so like self-defeating because, um, it, like all of these social problems compound each other. They compound other social problems. And the more they get out of control, the harder they are to fix, right? So it's really a paradox in the truest sense, like, like uh, mass shootings, homelessness, like all these problems just exacerbate each other. And this is truly what the meta crisis is, just realizing how overdetermined it is. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I still can't get over it. Like we are still kind of Bernie advocates at the end of the day, because that's where the lesson is for the past five years. You know, people, people need to learn that lesson and whatever, by whatever means, you know, so there's, there will be a lot of guilt involved and a lot of shame. Yeah. I think these are useful instruments, but also people have to recognize that it's okay. It's okay to be wrong. The best thing that you can do is recognize that you're wrong. And, and so we can move on. 
you know, no. if Keith Woods tomorrow could realize, oh, shit, I wasted a lot of time and energy on about this fucking white ethno state. <laughs> now I know why all those people were mad at me. You know, then we can move on. Yeah. You know, then he, he doesn't keep suffering. Yeah. Well, I'd be curious to talk to him more about like, like the construct of whiteness, which I think is more of a product of American culture than anything else, where a bunch of Europeans who spoke different languages, different religions, they came over here and eventually realized that they didn't want to be black. And so let's be white instead. Whereas like, I, I imagine, I just would be curious to know, because there's, there's an extent to which like, I get why an Irish person would want to protect their Irishness and, you know, and vice, you know, et cetera, through all the different European national identities. There's a real sense of a, a cultural and an ethnic rootedness in these very old countries. The United States doesn't have that. And the United States is therefore a very unique experiment that I would hope hasn't yet failed but every day makes me question that more and more. The, in the, you know, the experiment is, can there be such a thing as a pluralistic democracy? Uh, and can we, can we really organize a society on these universalistic values where cultures, religions, races from all around the, the, the world um, can find a place and, you know, some people will say, well, we need those diverse cultures to assimilate. And other people will say, no, what's great about America is the fact that we preserve the differences. And what's happening in our country now is, is that um, there's a rise in, 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 in a kind of, and this has happened before in American history, of a kind of white identity um, that is, it's in one way more inclusive than it's ever been because it doesn't, it includes the Irish now, you know, and it, it, it includes a lot of Jews and it, in, so it's more of an inclusive sense of whiteness than ever before. And they're even including some black people in there, you know, mm -hmm. like peppered in the RNC, the convention, you know, or these black conservatives. Um, and so yeah. it's, it's like, how do we avoid the capturing of the American collective imagination by this narrow, even though it's more inclusive than ever before, it's still a narrow sense of you, we should be, we should, we should align with the, uh, whether it's liberal, whether it's conservative or, or, you know, democratic, um, like we need to, I think, do a better job articulating like in concrete terms, like what America could look like if we, if we were truly pluralistic and truly democratic uh, and inclusive of difference as not a problem to be solved, but a reality to be celebrated. Uh, and to recognize that like, hey, yeah, I have my own unique heritage. I mean, me personally, I think like a lot of Americans, I'm pretty mixed actually, you know, half Ashkenazi Jew, half Franco German. That, North, that's North why you're European. so smart. <laughs> that's that's what the nazis are always telling me i don't i don't like to essentialize but uh <laughs> back when i was a fan of sam harris you know i think he's ashkenazi jew and it's like wow this guy's so smart it's like <laughs> those, right, well uh, there are there are there's these genes. race is a construct and it's real yeah and um so like how do we allow people to be like yeah this is where i come from but then also be interested to learn about other people. Like, oh, that's where you come from. Like, maybe we can learn from each other. Maybe we can, in our through our differences, lift each other up. Yeah, for for me and for a lot of people, right? A lot of people who are already there. It's like there's no there's no conflict between those ideas. You know, you can move freely between them, and and you can recognize that you can meet a black person who might have tons of personal experience with oppression and discrimination, but then you can also meet another black person who has none and they're completely sympathetic to the whole like pro white movements, you know? And so it's like, those things can be decoupled. And it's basically like, we have to maximize freedom, I suppose, individual freedom. And in a sense we already have. And so the question is then, well, why do people 
like why do people feel so stuck and tied to their identity um and i think it you know does go back to that link with economics like if people had more education and more job mobility and more spending money like they wouldn't be so emotionally invested in that cultural narrative you know so they yeah i don't know that's one that's just one link yeah well it just makes me think of the way that conservatives are worried about socialism because it's collectivism as if it's going to undermine individual rights <laughs> right and the, it's like no no actually we want to foster more individuality by making sure that everybody has the things that you the conditions that make individual freedom possible in the first place you know yeah the odd thing too is i actually think that like historically we're very primed now for a for a transition to like scientific socialism you know like we weren't in the early 20th century you know um like it was still very much the kind of late industrial revolution and now we're you know beyond the space age and the, into the information age and the the capitalist machine just like is constantly extracting value right and then it's like where is that value going so um if you wanted to we could kind of touch on mmt too because you had questions for me about that and that this kind of kind of hooks in and so we could like circle back to that concept mm -hmm. because my impression of mmt is that over time like and this this is a more of an intuition it's not from the readings but it's that over time capitalism actually accrues excess wealth right so over time it, mmt becomes more and more true and more viable in the sense that the printing of money is is decoupled from its impact on the economy right and so the the risk of printing too much money is inflation okay but like if there's enough wealth in the system that we can print as much money as we want and spend it in the right places then it doesn't actually disaffect the system it just decreases the wealth of some of the richest people relative to other people who now have more cash mm. well i mean um if if so mmt i think i just wonder if it assumes that the economy continues to grow because on the one hand like okay you print money how do you prevent infl inflation when the government invests in whatever infrastructure programs or something um you prevent inflation by taxing billionaires. So you put money in on one end and you take it out on the other. But the, uh, another way to mitigate inflation is that, well, a capitalist economy is supposed to grow. And that depends on at the base level that the human population continues to grow. You have more workers right. and more consumers. And so the, the issue is that whole logic of, it, it depends on growth. And the industrial growth model is ecologically suicidal i think um at least if it requires the growth of population so how do how do we work mmt into a degrowth scenario or a steady state scenario after degrowth like what does yeah. it look like in that context that's a good question i've thought i've thought a little bit about this but not too concretely because because the curve of the population isn't set to peak until like 2050, right? So we're still, you know, 30 years off from that. And so, th so this is- Which a is a model. I mean, an asteroid yeah, could hit tomorrow. Yeah, so it's, yeah. you know. But this is a <laughs> whole pandemic that's question. worse than this one. Anyways, <laughs> yeah. sorry. <laughs> it is, but it's also like relatively um, like um, accurate projection, you know, and it's, it's useful to take it seriously rather than not, because yeah. I've got my own dreams of an intervention on that. So we have a, a natural, we flatten the curve, so to speak, of population growth. I mean, I think that would be a good thing. Yeah, um, let's, let's co-op that uh, slogan for population. <laughs> yeah, but, but, you know, at least there is a kind of projection of it to, to peak and, and decline. And, I mean, I, th yeah, I suspect those, those projections would have to change in light of more recent events, but, but they have 
been pretty consistent for a long time now. And so what I'm saying is we should actually use those models more in our long-term speculations because like people like us, we want to, we don't want to wait any longer for capitalism to crumble further and to atomize people further. It's like enough is enough already. Right. And then there's people saying, well, you know, like, uh, like, uh, Michelle Bowen said this when I talked to him, he's like, wow, the culture's not there yet. They're not ready for Bernie. And I'm like, you know, I'm like, fuck that. Like, just if we had an honest media, like they would be ready, <laughs> you know? So, but there's this question of, well, when is the actual like right time and way to transition? Because as you're saying, I think there does have to be a correspondence with population because the whole idea of economics and capitalism changes when we're talking about now the shrinking. So less people means less productivity. However, automation is the new X factor, right? And automation has been around forever, but automation in a hyper overdrive sense where it completely is out of our hands, you know, and like you and I are knowledge workers. So we're not even directly involved in the sort of production process of things. So, but that will continue like, you know, vehicles are, are made in factories, you know, the people have less and less of a role that all they do is supervise the machines. So, you know, and in keeping with kind of Bratton's vision of geoengineering and stuff, like I think there's a certain inevitability to some of these trends. And then more our job is to help guide the politics to dovetail with what's actually happening. Hmm. And yeah, bringing it back to fascism. I mean, I just see no, no practical benefit in, in any of those turns politically it's all it's all just like self-interest and profit seeking so i mean yes and trying to promote such a common sense narrative but in the in the neoliberal frame self-interest and profit seeking is exactly what um our system would encourage black people to do like yes take what's yours you know, like this is the Childish Gambino song. This is America. You know, his, his, I think that there's a line like his grandma's like, get, get yours, like mm. get your money, you know, that's your money. Mm. And mm. it's like, it, it's ironic, but he's like, that's, that's what happens to anti-racism in the context of corporate capitalism uh, is, is it becomes this profit seeking self-serving thing, which like on the one hand, I can't tell a black person who's a descendant of slaves, like, no, that's not yours. You don't deserve, yeah. you know, so yeah. I can't, I'm not saying that, but this, we end up stuck in the same self-destructive system. Yeah. I was watching TMBS yesterday from Tuesday and it was the interview with Anna Kasparian and she said something like, you know, we need to like, show people how politics can work for them, you know, because most people don't believe that they're going to get anything out of participation, that they're going to get what they want. And I get that argument. But my reaction to to that phrasing is that, well, we also need to convince people and teach people that politics is about helping other people. And I've been on this line for a while, like, that it's not about you. Like my politics now isn't like, I have a, like a personal kind of perspective based on where I'm at. am like, I'm not even in the uh, labor sector. Right. Um, but, but my politics are motivated by what's best for other people. Right. Like the, so especially for those who are already disenfranchised and not part of the political system. So that I think that has to be part of the zeitgeist too. How can the most people think of politics unselfishly? I mean, that, that alone might be the solution to our problems just to get the, what, 50% of people who don't vote to pay attention. <laughs> yeah. Because the truth is like, even if they vote for Bernie, like it's going to be a slog for, for a few years for those people to get the benefits directly. Like, so that it's the, the direct, result of the vote is always going to be decoupled yeah you know it's always abstracted through so many 
you know, decisions and people. So yeah, it's a good approach. Like if people just voted for the best platform, period. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and then, and then, you know, that the kind of rising tide lifts all, all boats. Um, you know, I, I had to, uh, have a conversation with my mother the other day, um, who, uh, she's, she's just not political really doesn't have a formed opinion or theory of politics for any, by any stretch, but watches the news and she scrolls Facebook and like has a, a view where like, she hates Trump and she hates Biden and she thinks they're all corrupt. And she was like, I don't even want to vote. I'm not voting for any of these people. They're all criminals. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, yes, but mom, please <laughs> mm -hmm. for me and my brother vote, vote for Biden, please. And I convinced her, but um, there are a lot of people like that who just look at the whole thing and their access to the narratives comes through CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, and Facebook. And it creates cynicism that, that just discourages people from voting, the majority. And then the 25% on you know, either side, Democrat or Republican, get fired up by all that corporate media and they do vote. But most people are just, they get exposed to that whole circus and they don't want anything to do with it. They just stay home because they think, Neither one of these parties is gonna help me, so why do I care? That's our biggest problem, perhaps. Yeah. The systematic uh, disenfranchisement of uh, the power that, that voters should feel that they have to govern themselves by corporate media. Yeah, and at the end of the day, like the, the feeling what one gets of like participation through voting is mediated by their abstraction of it. Like mm -hmm. it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's you, you it kind of like you get out what you put in. Yeah. And so this is why for me, even though I'm not an American, right, I can't vote. Um, but, I didn't know uh, that. Yeah. I was I'm, talking to an American this whole time. <laughs> <laughs> Are you Canadian? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Now I was going to say, actually, like we have white nationalists here too. Like I know, I know some, um, yeah. and it's like, yeah, they don't want to talk. Like, you know, it's like, yeah. Wrong people always want to control the conversation and learn <laughs> nothing. <laughs> but, um, yeah, but, um, you know, I don't think that's how the world works or should work. Right. I'm a world citizen. I'm going to act as such. I'm going to try to meddle in every goddamn uh, election in the world through advocating for what's best, right? It's, it's pretty straightforward. <clears throat> but so, so it's up to each person to kind of reconcile what their participation means. Because I've always found, even here in Canada, like politics is boring. I don't know who to vote for. Like it, sometimes it's an inconvenience to like go to the polling station or whatever. So like, I'd like to see a lot of electoral reform so things are easier. But then my point about me, you know, feeling value and participating is just like the movement, you know, the grassroots Bernie movement, I'm proud to have been a part of even though it failed, right? Yeah. Because it's about doing the right thing. And so I feel good about that. And other people need to do some soul searching and think, well, do I really feel good about, you know, being a Hillary Clinton stan uh, with all that happened? Like, maybe I should reevaluate what happened. You know, maybe we should re revise the history. You know, I'm a proponent of historical revisionism too, because history is not correct in the first place. It constantly needs to be revised and improved and, and tweaked and ho you know honed and yeah yeah and i mean <clears throat> history will always be contested but uh it is important i think that we tell the story of what happened in 2016 and what happened in 2020 to the bernie movement in a way that is um uh that that uh <laughs> prevents the 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 narrative from being 
oh, Bernie only did so well in the primaries in 2016 because he had Russia's help, you know, Uh, (laughs) or, you know, that uh, America just wasn't ready for Bernie in 2020 still um, when, you know, clearly uh, he, he won the first four, you know. Yeah. In a very crowded primary. Yeah. And then, but this is again where it's like, you can say it's the media, but I think there's something else going on where as soon as we get to South Carolina, all of a sudden it's like, boom, hits the wall. And, um, and I know it's, there are a lot of factors and I don't, I'm trying to understand that better uh, because younger black people are totally on board with Bernie. So, and, and what is going on there? is what I, I, I don't understand. Is it just a, unwilling, a, a unwillingness to take a risk, which I get, in a risk in the sense that they're worried that the establishment wouldn't let someone like Bernie win. And so why waste a vote when we can go with the mild racism of Joe Biden? At least we know what we're getting and he's better than Trump, you know? So, um, yeah, we need to tell the story of what happened because the movement can't die with Bernie. Um, and I, you know, I've gone through phases of like deep grief um, and sadness um, earlier this year when when Bernie conceded and um, yeah. suspended his camp. I mean, even before he suspended, like after Super Two, when he lost Michigan, I was like, okay. And also, uh, I went through a little phase of like. Um, thinking I was naive for supporting him. Not, not that I don't think he was noble and, and a worthy cause, but as if I thought he could win. And I put all this energy into it. Right. When at the end of the day, it was just clear that the DNC was not going to allow it. Just, you know, he was there. I almost worried that I fell prey to this like trap they set for me. Like Bernie was there to let off the steam to allow leftists to think that they could still work within the democratic party and get so far. And then they crush us at the last second. Um, And I was like, I fell for that. And I, I'm not gonna let that happen again. I really don't think the democratic party can be reformed. If Biden wins, no way. If Biden loses, maybe if Biden wins, uh, it's not going to be a left friendly party at all. If it ever was, you know, it's going to be way more of a, um, conservative um political force yeah it's it's tough i think the sooner we organize uh an alternative party like you know there's this um i think it's in a couple days this online event with um like nina turner and and cornell west and others pushing for a people's party for right 2024 and even to run in in local races in 2020-22 um, and you know, I'm like, I can't say at this point that I'm that optimistic that it'll get any momentum, but at this, but yeah. I think like, okay, let's try to organize this now and see what happens. Um, cause I don't have any faith in the democratic party if Biden wins. Yeah. If Biden, if Biden loses, maybe things will be in enough disarray and there'll be enough reflection to be like, oh, maybe we've lost two elections in a row to a carnival barker reality tv star maybe we should try something else yeah i'm i'm trying to like be really not invested in the the ongoing political kind of commentary yeah even though like i i stay apprised through leftist channels but just in terms of like what things mean like oh biden you know picked clump kamala harris for vp like like there's so much speculation on the news, right? That we get caught up in it. And this is one of the reasons I liked like Michael Brooks the most as a commentator is I, I didn't have to get caught up in all the other noise from, you know, there's just a lot of it at the end of the day doesn't survive like the historical record. You know, it's just, it's just opinions on opinions on opinions. None of it matters. And so I try not to get too caught up in that because like <clears throat> the facts are that Bernie endorsed Biden and that he's put some faith himself in that doing so 
means the left will get more concessions. I mean, clearly, like, we're not seeing it happen as much as we like, but we, yeah, I'm just kind of holding my breath on all that because, like, I guess I agree. I, I'm cynical like you, but, but, um, like, um, yeah, I guess I'm just not confident enough in my own analysis either to make predictions. Yeah. But I, I definitely always have a vision of the way I think things should go. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, good stuff. I'm feeling better. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. I still, I still have you. a sense of um, urgency, which as anyone who cares should have a sense of urgency right now uh, just to, just to make sure that uh, we are like staying abreast of the, uh, the, the popular culture. And um, I think the left was caught off guard in 2016 with the rise of Trump and the way that um, the new internet media ecology was uh i mean the alt-right captured the flag and um the left has been playing catch up and i don't think we've got the flag back no uh, i agree so and I'll, I'll i'll tell you uh if we're wrapping up just to kind of to to close close out i'll tell you what i'm really concerned about that is yeah. within our locus of control because as much as we love all this politics stuff it's like out of our control right what concerns me is the ongoing kind of confusion and um, uh, contradictions within these adjacent communities right like integral um game B emerge you know the stoa i don't like what i'm seeing and i'm honest about that and i'm frank and, you know I, t I watched jeremy's talk of course i support him um and talked to him before um and after about that <clears throat> so you know like there's a lot going on and you know and and your uh conflict with david long and like we're all trying to make inroads into some sort of synthesis or consensus right and it's just it's not happening it's not <laughs> working and this makes me really depressed and disillusioned because yeah like you know i try to encourage these communities to accept critique you know, to take critique to heart about the intellectual dark web, about wh whatever. And it's just, it's so slow, you know, like Brett Weinstein is going on the STOA soon, you know, yeah. and it, is, it, it does not compute for me. We're not. Uh, and so, you know, I'm, I'm trying to talk about like, what, what can we solve? What should we be able to solve within our wheelhouse, within our, a uh, circle of friends and networks and it's like if we can't solve this we can't solve the macro problem either this is like a microcosm of the macrocosm mm -hmm. <clears throat> so yeah god sakes can we solve anything <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and can there be a turning point that we feel when the left starts to gain traction and credibility in these in these uh, other communities mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I, I appreciate you trying to direct our attention to more local uh, issues that we, we, can, we can get a grip on maybe um, more effectively. Uh, I think, yeah, I mean, I, I really appreciate the work you've been doing to, as you say, build consensus and, um, you know, in my own way, I, I think I'm trying to do something similar. And, um, you know, I, I, uh, I definitely enjoy talking to you and talking to people that I um, generally feel like we already have agreement about a lot of things, but I also really want to do more to reach out across what might seem at first like un unbridgeable divides to see where like, um, common ground can be found because um, I just see, you know, even with this guy, um, Keith Woods, like he's very smart, but when he starts talking about politics and, and left, right, this, it's very, um, 
it becomes very um, performative almost. Like we just get locked into these these polemics that um, aren't aren't they're they're just too abstract, and we're not. We need to talk to each other, you know and really understand each other and not caricature. So um, maybe that'll be my, my source of hope to uh, continue to make efforts to understand one another. And yeah. Um, yeah, there's no reason, especially somebody like you and David Long couldn't like, like. We might agree about politics. I don't know, we, we didn't talk about <laughs> Yeah, I didn't I didn't watch your your talk with him. I didn't dive into the details of that, but mm -hmm. when things like polarize along lines like oh, it's emergentism versus panpsychism, I'm like I'm like what? <laughs> like can't we just like value <laughs> all of these concepts as like, you yeah. know, intellectuals like like the, there there's reconciling to be done, but we shouldn't get divided along these lines and yeah. You know, I think there's a well, lot of misinterpretation yeah. and yeah well not we're not going to get into that right now but just to say i um i think um in that debate i probably defended emergentism um more articulately than david even did because he didn't really try to and yeah in that case when we're talking about metaphysics and cosmology, it seems peripheral to the human political everyday, like how do we get along sort of problems, but uh, it's not, it is on the periphery, but it's all connected. And, um, you know, if we do, if we do need to construct or discover, become sensitive to a deeper, like substratum of commonality that can bind us on a planetary level, as a species, I think it might have something to do with some consensus on cosmological questions, where we came from, uh, what we are, and 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 what we're capable of. You know, like if we if we have consensus on those issues, which means if we understand uh, our cosmological context, um, then I think we can begin to construct an international socialist. Uh, human community <laughs> yeah for sure so. yeah so we'll just keep trying to build out our consensus <laughs> and um yeah you know the more authentic that consensus is then the more kind of you know it, it's self-evident and it gets can get traction and people can stop wasting time like with dogma you know mm -hmm. Yeah, I just got a text from Bernie, actually, <laughs> to uh, help elect the most progressive Congress possible. Um, I'll probably chip in five bucks for that, sure. All right, Brent, uh, I always appreciate dialoguing with you. So thanks for your yeah, time. Yeah, thanks, Matthew. No problem. Yeah, and uh, I'll be in touch. And I'll, I'll, probably, I'll throw this up on my channel if, if that's cool. Yeah, sure. Awesome. All right. Well, take care of yourself. All right. See you later. Bye.